This long and sometimes boring video is divided up into several sections. The first section explains how domain names work and how people try to use similar looking domain names to make a user think that the email is from an official source. The next section is about different types of email fraud. The remaining sections show examples of how these techniques are used in the Windows 10 mail client, Outlook mail client, Outlook web mail client, a popular Gmail client, Gmail web interface, and an Android email client. Before we start examining emails to spot fake addresses and links, I'm going to explain domain names and each of their components. It will help you understand how fake domain names are used to trick people into thinking that the email is from a legitimate source. If you think you're pretty good at spotting fake domain names, uh, you may want to skip to this video's uh, four minute mark where I start talking about how to spot them in email. Now, domain names are used because they're text representations of a website's IP address. It's much easier to remember the name of the website versus the IP address of the servers that it resides on. For example, here's www.microsoft.com and one of the IP addresses that is used for the server that hosts some of its content. In truth, they have many of them. So it would be a lot easier to remember to type www.microsoft.com than a variety of IP addresses. To demonstrate this, here I am looking up microsoft.com and it will show me all the IP addresses that are associated with that particular web address. So let's take a look at the structure of a website domain name. It has three sections. The subdomain in the beginning, the next part is what's called the Sherpa or the business name section, and the top level is the type of uh, domain it is. Now the first part of it, which is the subdomain type, can be any descriptor that the business decides uh, it needs. The standard is www that everybody uses, but you can also have for a mail server, it can be mail.something, or any special name that the business wants to put in front of it. Although cleverly worded section here can add to the deceptions, this section we're not really that concerned with. It's the next section, the actual business name or the Sherpa section that we want to look at. Now in this section we have the actual name of the business or their website that's representing their business. I'll give you two examples here, Microsoft.com and BankofAmerica.com. Now the last section we're going to take a look at is the TLD or top level domain section. And the creation of these are tightly controlled as to the types like .com, .net, etc. There's a lot more of them now. But we're going to show you how those also can contribute to the deception and make you think you're talking to a different company. So back to the center of the Sherpa section. You see we have Microsoft.com, but I've created some other ones that I just made up. Offers.Microsoft.com, Help-Microsoft.com. And that's because domain names can have a dash. Now normally it's a little bit controlled if you can use somebody else's name in there, but none of these others are actual Microsoft websites. They're imitations. And that's why in emails we're going to take a look at what the actual extension of the email address is, if it matches exactly the business or some other variation. And lastly we're going to take a look at the top level domain at the end to show you that the same company name followed by a different TLD it's not really that company, but a completely different company somewhere in the world. Now with a major company like Microsoft, they've got it all covered. If you type in AZ, for example, it'll actually go and redirect it to Microsoft site, but uh, for that language or country. The same here is for Russia, for example. And things can get even worse. They can combine different things. The Sherpa section with the dashes with a different extension at the end, or even misspellings, as you can see in the last two examples. You just have to be careful of what you're going to be clicking on. Now that we think we understand the uh, domain name structure, uh, a few years back a new technique was created called a URL shortener. And what it does is it takes long names, uh, www, really long name, then creates a small short link so it appears easier in emails or other advertisements or whatever. And you, here you see how the, the name has been changed to a shortened address. Problem is, uh, email fraudsters have used that to hide their domain names. So what you'll see, instead of a really long business name, or in their case, their sketchy uh, fraud name, you'll just see this shortened uh, address down below. It's important to understand this when you're hovering over things. And I'll give an example of this a little bit later in the uh, video. Now to clarify, or maybe confuse even more, we have to understand that both email addresses and links are constructed. 
There's a visual element, and then there's the underlying actual link or address. To help understand it, here's an actual dialog box from Windows that shows both the text of display up top and it also shows the actual website address at the bottom. And this holds true for email addresses as well. You may see an address from Fred, your friend that you know, but underneath that it has this actual email address. For example, here's a voice message that says, listen to voice note. Well, guess what? That's the text on top. There's a link underneath that. So let's move on and see how we can find these fake email addresses or fake uh, links to websites inside the document itself. So using what we've learned about website addresses, email addresses, links, and how they're constructed, we'll be able to examine the types of email fraud. We're going to see how those fake emails are used, how we have dangerous attachments, and we even can have links with embedded uh, operating system commands. Although I have four different email accounts set up in my Windows 10 mail client, some Outlook, some Gmail, and some other services, I'm not going to show the techniques here. Rather, I'm going to show the techniques in several other email interfaces, but those techniques can be used here in the Windows 10 mail client as well. For example, here's a Fandango email with the sender's address clearly shown in the top. One of the more serious fraud attempts is an email trying to get you to verify your information on a financial services site, such as PayPal or your bank. Uh, here's one I got. It's supposed to be from PayPal, but if you look up here in the address, Outlook exposes the underlying address, which is sec at sec.com. Obviously not. Another one, update at confirm.com. But let's say you don't even see that, and you just see the links and read what's down here. Before you click on it, you always want to hover on it, because you never know where it's going to go. So when I hover over that link, you see that it exposes the true address. And if we look at the first part of that, you'll see it's from SendGrid.net, definitely not PayPal. Now, while we're talking about uh, email links, I want to talk about a particularly dangerous type of link, links with embedded OS commands. Now, this type of link is using several techniques. I don't have a visual example of this one, but first it appears as just a link with an Oculus name. Hovering over it reveals, instead of a direct link to a website, it executes a Windows PowerShell command that connects to a website to start an unknown process. Most probably would do serious damage to your system and or files. Avoid these at all costs. Hopefully, if your system security is set up correctly, it will prompt you before executing this and you can stop it. But if it should happen to run, perhaps the best thing to do is to do an emergency shutdown of your system. Then you can restart your system. Hopefully the process isn't running anymore and you can check your system out to make sure everything's okay. Okay, now we're going to take a look at attachments. And you'll see attachments like this with a zip file attached. Uh, it could be uh, other files. It could be a Word doc like this one. Unless you're absolutely sure you know where this came from, you should never download or open these documents. Remember, this is called a virus for a reason. Even if you know the person who's sending you this, you don't know what they've been doing browsing and if they picked up a virus and now it's been transferred to their Microsoft Word. Now, newer Word doesn't let you open it up unless it's in protected mode, uh, so you're a little safer. But again, zip files, anything that's attached, be a little more cautious. Now, here's a different one which has an ACE extension, which is not common. Uh, somebody might not know what it is. So simply go to the web, do a search on the extension name, and you'll see here that it's just another zip file. Okay, switching over to the web interface for Outlook, not the client. You'll see here I have an email from Microsoft Rewards. And if we hover over it, you'll see that it in fact comes from e.microsoft.com. So you're pretty much guaranteed it's safe. If we revisit the slide that I had earlier, you'll see that the e.microsoft conforms to this. And it doesn't have any dashes in it. So it is from Microsoft. So now that we know that, let's look at the actual email. And we can see if we hover over the address, there's the address. If we click on the three buttons over here, it will actually open up the side panel. We can go down uh, to the open source or view source and look what we get. We get the source of it again. We can double and triple check uh, this way. Now, here's one more example from my gym, and they have a different email address because they have a gymsales.net, which is their marketing firm that they've hired in order to promote their stuff. 
And you notice it differs from their email from the contact below. If I go look up gymsales.net, I can go in here. I just simply type in their domain name and it will tell me uh, who that is. And if you look here, I'm going to cut to the end here, but here's the uh, domain name at the bottom. And it says it's the Endurance International, completely different company. It's just a marketing company that handles email communications. So what does that tell you? Well, it doesn't necessarily tell you that they're an honest company. Now, you can also go out to their website, take a look at it, see if it's professionally made, see if they, in fact, are what they appear to be. Uh, check it for any obvious spelling errors or any other things that may give an indication if they're really who they say they are. So those same techniques are not going to be used. We're going to go take a look at uh, a mail client for Google. It's called Mailbird. And uh, it's basically the same thing as what Outlook is, uh, but it's just uh, an independent developer who's made a, this email client for Gmail. The techniques here apply to all the other ones. So when I hover over the from address, it gives me the exact address of whoever uh, sent me that particular email. Similarly, if we open up another email, uh, this one will be from Fandango. It does the same thing. So this mail client, along with other ones, do it about the same. Now here's a link within the email, and that's how it looks uh, when you hover over it, just like it did in the uh, Outlook client. And just like before, if you uh, go over to the menu over here and you can click on the source, there's a message source that you can take a look at and see if you find anything fraudulent in there. So now that we've examined all these techniques, we're going to go into Gmail through a web browser and uh, going to see how we can apply them here. Uh, first of all, I've already clicked on the address of the person. You see the full address information there. And it has, obviously, it came from iHeartRadio. Next, when I click on uh, View Message Source, sure enough, there's all the information there about it as well. And lastly, if I hover over a link, we can take a look at what, where that link is going to go to. As you can see, I've hovered over the link here, and it shows you down the lower left-hand corner exactly the details of where that's going to go. Okay, the fact of the matter is, is that many of us use our cell phones. So how do we do this when we're on our cell phone? Well, if you notice here, here's a list of uh, my emails I have coming in today. If I click on the first one, I'll see that it's from Newegg.com. Okay, it doesn't say where that is, so the actual email address. But if I click anywhere here off to the little side a little bit, it'll expand and show me who sent the actual email. So then if we skip down to the body and we click somewhere on the body and we press and hold, not just click, otherwise you'll launch it, you'll end up with the uh, address showing down below. Now, you definitely don't want to click on the second one, open in browser, because that's what you're trying to avoid, because you don't know where it's from. You want to click on the other one where it says copy link address. So that puts it into your phone's copy buffer, and you can open up a text editor like I have here, and paste it in there so I can examine the entire link. Now, in this one, I can see that shortly after the beginning of it, I can see it's coming from promo at flashnewegg.com. So newegg.com tells me it's okay. There you have it. Hopefully this will help you spot some fake emails when uh, one or two of them do get through and give you a little more understanding about how, uh, how these guys are trying to trick you out there. Hey, if you found this video helpful, don't forget to like this video. And if you want to get more, just subscribe to Old Guy Geek. You can also follow me at Facebook or Twitter. The links to those are in the description of this video.